Well, congratulations on this film. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I got to check it out recently, and um, it's one of these movies that's kind of like life unfolds before you instead of and nothing ever feels staged, which I really admire because it's it's hard to pull that off sometimes. Um, I tried to look. I was wondering if you could tell me what the movie's title means. I was looking for its meaning. I couldn't quite find it. Um, a chambra is literally just the street that they live on. Oh, okay. So that neighborhood um, sort of came up around that one street, which is known as Contra de Chambra. And as a nickname, everyone just started referring to the whole neighborhood or the grouping of houses as the Chambra. Right. So it's a name that's fiercely regional and like very, very specific to that town and that neighborhood. Nice. Yeah. That's good, because, yeah, I was wondering about that. I was like, I know the me I know the mean of it somewhere, if I find it. And um, the Amato family, it's, it's so great to see so many different generations of one family here in one film, because you get to see, just from their faces, how they look at life and what life has done to them. Um, and you get to see each of their viewpoints at one point or another, um, even though the movie focuses mostly on Pio. Uh, was it challenging to get all those individual viewpoints into the film? It's, I mean, you know, it's the kind of thing where the, the approach dictated what the content would be. Like, for me, it was very important to, to, to make Pio the center of the film, you know? Like, I got to know that world through Pio, so I figured he would be the best tour guide for any audience, you know what I mean? Because he, he, he looks at the place through the eyes of someone who's growing up there and trying to make sense of it himself. So, you know, this, after deciding to make Pio the sort of tour guide, everything else sort of fell into place. Like, I didn't ever want him to feel like he was acting. I never wanted him to feel like he was um, doing something that he wouldn't normally do or something that was outside of his actual experience. So, in order to sort of harness that authenticity, the idea was to sort of put his family in it as well. And so each of them brought to the film their own experiences. You know, so their viewpoints naturally came in because, you know, in order to to um, make Pio feel at ease, I need to make sure that you know all of his family was constantly around. Him, right. So the idea there was just sort of like have everyone play some version of themselves, have everyone do things that they would normally do in real life, and as a result, we got you know all the various viewpoints and all the familial and generational differences all crammed into one film. Yeah, it's almost kind of like a documentary feel kind of movie because yeah, you can sort of see these get. This is a movie where the characters inhabit or the people inhabit the roles instead of play them. And um, I mean, you worked mostly with non-professional actors in this film, um, and some of these actors also come from your previous film, Mediterranean. And how did you go about working with them in terms of getting them to act naturally on screen? Yeah, I mean, this it's it's hard to talk about because it's not like there was one process, one philosophy that worked for all of them. You know, like as you mentioned before, some of them had worked with me previously. You know, so Pio and I had done a short film together, he had a small role in Mediterranean, even in one of his sisters has a small role in Mediterranean, so they knew what the mechanism looked like. Like they knew, you know, the general um, basic rhythms of a film set, like action, here we go, we're waiting the light. So they weren't as put off by, you know, the 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 the, the the semi-imposing nature of a sort of like film um, structure, you know what I mean? But everyone else was about getting them used to that, you know what I mean? So I spent a lot of time down there shooting with my iPhone, you know, sort of like preparing them for what things would be so that when it came time to actually shoot the film, it wouldn't seem so strange to them. You know what I mean? So like, you know, the, the first step is always like, don't look at the camera. Then it's like, don't smile. And from that to be yourself or sort of... Um, one, I'm sorry, once that is done, you know, once they're used to the mechanism, the apparatus of the filmmaking process, like once that fades to the background, you, you know, it's just a, word, a matter of having them reconnect emotionally to the moment that we're trying to recreate. You know what I mean? So like you said before, like the film, you know, when we're shooting, it doesn't have a documentary aspect, but when I write the film, I write it in a very documentary way, meaning like I'll see something that happens and I'll write that into the script. You know what I mean? So they're, when they're acting, they're actually just recreating or reenacting something I've seen them do in the past. So the, the whole key is to make to get them in that emotional space again, remind them of how they felt when they did what I wrote, and then do it again. Nice, yeah. It's nice that you start out with an iPhone. It's sort of like building your way up to the actual camera because it's sort of like the trick is to get them to not be so self-conscious, right? And to get used to saying things on command. So, right. like, you know, one example is like, you know, the the dinner table scene, you know, it's it's the scene that feels the most free form, but it's the one that's very, very close. It's like, you know, one of the scenes is actually very, very, very close to the script as well. Not one of the scenes, but it's a scene that people would not think 
would be close to the script and it is and so when when we when I was writing that scene you know I knew that at some point I wanted to a show what it's like to live in this family but B sort of show um, how they felt about the African community that's through conversation and dialogue so I'd written something that was okay but at some point the mother told the story that she ends up telling in the film about like the African guy who like punches the glass and gets bloody that she sees in the hospital so I wrote that story into the script, the story she'd actually told me, and over the next years, I would constantly tell her to tell me that story again. Right? So we were rehearsing even though she didn't know it. You know what I mean? I would constantly say to her, like, what happened that time? And she would tell me the story. And then at dinner, I'd say, why don't you tell everyone that story? And she'd tell everyone that story. So when we actually went to shoot the film, I told her to tell the story. She realized that I'd been preparing her over the past years for that moment when she would have to do it on camera. And it was sort of like that for every scene. You know what I mean? Like when the kids are burning copper, um, you know, all the little moments between them are things that I'd seen that just need to get them to redo again. That's brilliant. Yeah, because it's like the, the whole scene, that's like, a, that's like a Thanksgiving dinner scene with the family. <laughs> because it's like I've seen so many dinner scenes like that, but it, it's one that feels truly alive. And it's interesting to say that you, you make it sound very structured, and it does feel very free form. Um, and that's just fascinating to me. And um, also, you, um, the environment these characters exist in feels like a very suffocating one almost because it's, it's strewn with a lot of garbage and it's like when you see the train going by it's almost kind of like dreamlike in that it sort of offers an escape from a place that offers no easy escape. Um, and was that train, was the scene of the train going by, was that always in the script or is that something that just came about? You know, that's always been in the script. I mean, I always found it, I was always struck by what you just said, but that's something that didn't strike me on a cinematic level, it just struck me in terms of one of the ironies of living there, right? Like these people who used to be on the road, they've come to this place, but there's always this reminder of travel just behind where they live. Like just on the horizon. And in Mediterranean, the first one we did, um, there was the same thing with the train going by the refugee camp, you know? These people who had traveled for so long, became part of this community, constantly had this reminder of them being able to leave or not. You know, so I find that to be um, not necessarily a metaphor, but an important reminder of the choice people make to stay and the change in lifestyle that, um, that, that, that comes um, or the, the changes that influence, that affect the community as a result of deciding to remain set in time. Awesome. That's brilliant. And, um, also, I mean, what I loved about Pio's performance is the arc his character takes from being, you know, wanting to be like his brother and trying to provide for the family. Towards the last half of the movie, we see him developing a conscience of sorts where he's forced to, he's put in a position where he may have to betray his best friend, an African. And um, what was it, this, there, the one scene that really struck me is where you see him just starting to tear up. What was it like directing Pio in that particular scene? <clears throat> that scene is a very charged emotional scene, but for many reasons. I mean, you know, the relationship that Pio has with Aiva in the film is very much based on the actual relationship that he has with Aiva, but it's also largely based on the relationship he has with me. Like, Aiva and I are roommates now. We've been living together for seven years. You know what I mean? So Pio knows us together. Um, and we feel, both, both Kudos and I, Aiva and I, feel very, very privileged to be caught, to been allowed into this community. You know, like I've known Pio since he's nine years old. He does look at me sort of like as a surrogate brother figure, you know what I mean? We have a very strict relationship, a very intimate relationship. But at the same time, there have constantly been reminders over the past seven years, we've constantly had these reminders where it's been very clear to both um, Kudus, who's the Aiva character, and myself that even though Pio Baz is his brother, he would never betray his community for us. And certain things have happened similar to that last scene where, um, where the, that line has been drawn. You know, where maybe some things have happened between myself and his family, and I've asked Pio to intervene, and Pio has showed, showed sided with his family, even though I could tell that it was hard for him to not necessarily betray me, but to not necessarily side with me when he thought that I was being wrong, so to say. I know that's vague, but there are specific examples of it. So when we came to shoot that scene, when I came to write that scene in the first place, for me it was very important to show that you know, because I think the greatest potential and the greatest limit of that community is that solidarity. Like on one hand, they've created this really tight social network, this social net that's allowed them to survive for over a hundred years. You know what I mean? Like they have constantly gone ahead because of the solidarity between them. Because of the fact that they say, Queen of Suna di Fama, like no one will die of hunger. On the other hand, someone like Pio and many people in his family, they're unable to 
transcend the social architecture of their place because they have these rules that they need to respect. Right, so for me it was very important to show that element in the film, and that's where sort of this betrayal came in. Right, and for me, you know, I wanted to show that Pio ultimately would side with his community, but that it would be difficult for him. Because that's the key to the scene, I think. It's not that he betrays his friend, it's how he feels about doing it. So he feels he has to do it, you know what I mean? But at the same time, like he feels conflicted about it. Um, so when I went to direct that scene with Pio, I reminded him of this incident that was somewhere that happened between us, and I let him know how much that hurt me. And he ultimately went back to that place where he had to do that thing, and he lived it through my eyes, and we were able to get to that point where he was actually feeling in that scene what he felt in the experience um, that happened between us in the end. So again, just like every other scene in the film was about reconnecting him emotionally to something that had happened in his past. There's definitely a connection there. You can see it on the screen. It's sort of like, it's interesting to see what actors can accomplish without words. And that's where the real challenge of film acting lies. Yeah. So the minute that you got act people who were not professional actors to do that is very impressive. Yeah, Pio's like very good at like, you know, we work together to finding the emotional truth of each scene. And like, you know, because, you know, he does what a lot of actors consider method. You know, he goes to some place in his life, relives it, and then those emotions come out. The difference is he's connecting to his own life, mm -hmm. whereas other people are connecting to moments in their life to portray another person. Right, absolutely. And I, I read that during the movie's 90-day shoot that you found yourself spending hours wrangling all the actors together and also that you had to deal with people sabotaging your equipment at times. And I'm just curious, how do you keep your sanity intact in situations like that? I, th I mean, luckily, you know, I've been, I've been part of that community for so long that even though these crazy things happened, they didn't surprise me. Like, I always knew they were going to happen. In fact, you know, I was, I wouldn't say pleasantly surprised, but I would say that things certainly calmed down more as the shoot went on. Um, like, in the beginning, there was almost like a riot, like the first we shot, because some people wanted to be extras, other people weren't allowed to be, they thought that they weren't chosen because other people spoke badly about them, and all the internal dynamics and jealousies of that community came out in the first few days, and afterwards, they started to die down. So, you know, when they sabotaged our equipment, we all sort of looked at each other like, all right, like we knew this was gonna happen, we're upset about it, we'll find out who did it later, but we'll just roll with the punches. And the, the, that was the key to the film, was just essentially rolling with the punches, don't let anything surprise you, um, and also don't be upset by anything that happens. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. It's it's interesting when the police arrive at certain different points in this movie, it's almost like they're aliens from another planet. It's, it's like this, this town is so isolated to where the police are such strangers in it, you know what I mean? And um, is it was is that always the case in that specific town or? Yeah, I mean, I never I would never forget one of the first things when I was first sort of becoming um, um, ingratiating myself with the community. Um, one of the things I would do is I would constantly play um, soccer with the kids in like this field right behind the chapel. So I would go there like maybe every day for about three or four hours, bring some goals, bring a soccer ball, and we would just have fun. I'll never forget the first time that I heard kids from a rooftop screaming Banyale, which means cops, and seeing everyone, all the men who were technically under house arrest, just sprint toward their windows. And I was like, what the hell's happening here? Like, all oh, the cops are coming. And everyone just started hiding. And that's one of those moments where I realized the solidarity that was there, this us versus them mentality, where it's like, we may have differences between us, we may sabotage their equipment because they're favoring you instead of us, but when the cops come, we're all on the same side. We don't want anyone to get caught. You know what I mean? I remember being struck by that moment, just seeing these men, these grown men running like kids, jumping into windows to hide from the cops, and everyone acting like it was totally normal. And like that was one of the first glimpses I got of this, 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 um, this us against the world vibe that you feel when you're down there. That's interesting. Yeah, I love the symphony of voices that comes up once the cops appear. It's just like everybody's on the same page, like going, "The police are coming! The police are coming!" That's that's just that's that that just is an amazing moment. You know, where, where you have people with all these differences, yet they come together over a common bond. And um, I have to ask you about this. One of the, Mar uh, one of the executive producers of the movie is Mark Scorsese, who managed to sit through several different cuts of your film and gave you notes. Was there a specific note that really informed you about movie making from him? I mean, the interesting thing is obviously he's one of the great filmmakers of all time maybe the best alive on the planet right now. You know what I mean, like he's an unbelievable filmmaker, he's an unbelievable editor, director, even a great actor, you know what I mean? But the thing that struck me about his notes is that he didn't want to discuss it as a filmmaker at first. 
like the first things he spoke to me about were as his, as his, um, um, his sensations as an audience member. And I think, and it sort of struck me that that might be one of the great keys to his brilliant filmmaking is that he loves cinema and he experiences cinema. Like he tries to look at it as a quote unquote civilian and he lets the film arrive to him the way it would arrive as an audience. And I think that awareness of the way the filmmaking affects the audience is what makes his filmmaking so precise. So when we first spoke about the film, he was like, you know, we'll talk about editing later. We'll talk about music later. I want, I need, like, he told me his emotional um, journey through the film. And through that, I was able to see what worked and what didn't work. And through that, we were able to sort of refine um, and, 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 and make more specific the emotional reactions that um, were the most important for him as a viewer and for me as a director. So what struck me was how he came at it at first, you know? He spoke about it the way he speaks about films that he's just watched, you know? Like, I've always watched it my voice through Italy, you know? And the way he, like, speaks about the kids in Shusha, for example. He was speaking about Pio in the same way. You know, like, he's, when he, whenever he speaks, when he does these documentaries about filmmaking, you know, what strikes me is he always ties it back to the first time he saw it, you know, the time my father took me to the theater, or when we were all in Little Italy and everyone would gather around the film, how it was a way for everyone to get back to their communities in Italy. He spoke about a chambra like that, you know, he spoke about a chambra as a film that he experienced as a viewer. And I think that that was the key, to remember that, yes, we're filmmakers, but we're filmmakers making something for people to see, for people to live, and that was invaluable. That's great, that's great, yeah. Yeah, there's few cinephiles in the world that like him right now. They're really, that's really true. Because yeah, he I mean, really goes, but when it comes to movies, he goes way back. I mean, certain people will probably step in like the 60s or the 70s, but he, he doesn't leave anything out. Which it's is not great. just that. Like, not only does he know all of cinema, he's committed to preserving it. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, he's very, like, you know, we have this thing in Italy, which is one, maybe my favorite film festival in the world, which is called, like, Il Cinema Ritrovato which is essentially a cinema of um, only restored films, the festival of only restored films. So, you know, this year we were sitting in Piazza Maggiore watching La Talande. You know what I mean? The newly restored print of La Talande. And before 90% of these screenings, there's a video from Scorsese where you find out that he contributed to the restoration of that print. You know what I mean? So he's also doing a lot to preserve cinematic history and culture, which I think is invaluable. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, Regarding Pio, there's there's another couple of moments that really stood out to me is when he's in this enclosed space and you see him sweating profusely and just getting really nervous. Uh, was that something? Is he is he claustrophobic in real life? Yeah, yeah, he's actually claustrophobic. In fact, you know when you see the behind the scenes of that film, we had to build that elevator and put it on my terrace so that there was a removable wall so he could actually get in it. Like he's he's I don't know what he's terribly afraid of. of fast moving things and enclosed spaces. Um, so actually when we, we went to premiere the film in Cannes, you know, the idea was to fly everyone up, but none of them would do that. So we ended up driving from the south of Italy to Cannes for the premiere because it was the only way to get them to go. Nice. Yeah. Now it's interesting because, yeah, I mean, it's such a real moment and it's great for him to confront his fear like that on screen. Um, I mean, was it struggle to get into that moment or was he open to doing that scene? Or? Yeah, he was open to doing the scene. I mean, he was, you know, he, he's, he, in general, he was very open to the film. Like, he, like, understood what we were doing, and he liked what we were doing. But on the flip side of that, he's not an awesome kid. You know what I mean? It's like, at a certain point, it became like making a kid go to school. Like, there are moments where he didn't want to work, he wants to just hang out with his friends. You know, there are moments where he's like, let me sleep for five more hours. You know what I mean? I was up until two in the morning. So, you know, we had to run up, we ran up against any, uh, all the challenges that it is to sort of try and harness the, the energy of an adolescent boy. But in general, he was never afraid to do things or go places that the script asked him to do because he was committed to the film. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, no, I know, I, I have trouble getting up in the morning too, so I can relate. <laughs> and also, um, one last question. Uh, the ending of the movie, I was, I was a bit perplexed by it because it doesn't quite spell things out, but at the same time, you could see it as both optimistic and somewhat pessimistic. What do you hope people get from the ending? I mean, I hope people, I think that I'd like it to be a sort of um, barometer for how people look at the situation. Like, I'm particularly very optimistic about the situation, even though I feel that there is a sad ending. Obviously, I wouldn't have liked Pio's relationship and Naiva's relationship to not take that turn. At the same time, it feels very true, and I want to respect the truth of their situation. But at the same time, you know, I leave the film with a sense of optimism because I think that in history and life, we make small steps forward, not giant leaps. And I think that if there is a road, if there's a path towards solidarity between the African community 
and the gypsy community, it's gonna be through someone like Pio. Like I think that obviously his brother and his family and his mother and father have limitations. There's certain boundaries they'll never be able to um, 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 overcome. Pio, on the other hand, we see that he does feel at home with that community. We see that he is able to find um, um, a place of comfort with Kudus and Naiva and his friends. And I think that if we're going to move forward, it's going to be through someone like Pio. And it makes me optimistic to know that the next generation of kids is more like Pio than they are like, you know, the people who are maybe slightly more xenophobic from earlier generations. Yeah. That's what I love is that Pio is able to move around those communities. So there is the hope that, yeah, Pio is the one who could probably bring them together. Or it's so. not Pio, the next generation. Or the next generation. You know what I mean? But, you know, I do think that ultimately, like, I'm happy that Pio gets to grow up in the way that he does. I'm happy that he still feels part of his community because like I said before, that community is fundamental, has been fundamental to their survival for so long. Um, you know, and I'm just generally optimistic knowing that there are people like Pio out in the world. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you very much for your time, John. Thank this you, man. I appreciate wonderful it. Film. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay.